It is pretty special to be here on another Sunday evening and with my brethren. Glad for those that have come out again tonight. I want to say with this, uh, take the opportunity to say that I uh, appreciate um, being asked to do this uh, by the elders, and I. Um, it's quite an honor to stand up here, where I do know that so many great preachers have stood here, <laughs> and uh, I'm I'm not a great preacher, <laughs> uh, as as you probably know by now. But stay with the word. We. Uh, got to talk about my favorite subject, which is Jesus today, and uh, hopefully it has been uh, helpful to you uh, as much as it's been a joy for me to uh, to do this. Tonight we're going to study, you remember, uh, we have already looked at the profile of a disciple. We did that in our class this morning, those that were uh, in this class, where we talked about we were to abide in uh, the word of Jesus. Jesus said, you've got to abide in my word, and then you'll be my disciples indeed. And we talked about what that meant, about being a student of God's word and being a doer of God's word. Another characteristic that we looked at is that we are to love the brethren. If we don't love the brethren again, Jesus says, you cannot be my disciple. And then we looked at the cost involved of being a Christian. Uh, There's a high cost to pay, but we ran out of time before I got to say it costs more to not be a Christian. And that's something we need to keep in mind. Yes, it takes every, I'm giving everything I own, if you will, everything within me to be be a, a Christian. But at the same time, if I'm not a Christian, um, we know uh, the blessings that we will miss out on. So tonight I want to look at how Jesus treated other people and uh, see if we can learn maybe a principle or two there for our day-to-day living uh, to try and be more like Jesus. If you got your Bibles, hope that you do. Uh, we're going to look at several passages, and we're going to really read them. They're accounts of where Jesus dealt with people and how he dealt with them. And some of this, uh, it's fascinating, and I know you've heard it a lot before, and uh, uh, it's still worth going over and over again. Uh, the first one is in Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, and we will begin reading in verse 36. Luke 7, 36. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. Of course, Jesus talking, uh, the Pharisee asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. Now, first of all, we might know that the tables back then, is my understanding, is not like our eating tables today where you can put your feet under the table and sit down in a chair but rather the tables at this time they were about 18 inches high uh, pretty short in our standards today so you're not going to put your feet under it very easy so what you do is you they would lean on their left side and eat with their right hand with their feet uh, going out away from the table uh, to the side and that and if everybody uh, did that, you see, you could, it's kind of like angle parking, you know, you'd all have a place at the table uh, if you everybody followed the plan there. So that's how they kind of ate, and, and this uh, Pharisee that asked Jesus to come, verse 37, and behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil. Now, it says this woman was a sinner. Some have said that she was a woman of ill repute. We just don't know that. She might have been a harlot in the city or something like that. But the Bible just simply says she was a sinner. And obviously, as we read the story, it must have been something that everybody pretty much knew about, at least uh, I was expected to know about this woman. And in verse 38, and stood at his feet behind him weeping. Now this is a woman that's there, and she's standing there at Jesus' feet, and she's crying. Well, why? Why would she be crying? 
And it says she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil. Well, again, we don't know for sure why we, she was crying. Whether it was because she knew somehow that Jesus was, was going to be crucified. But probably, as we read the story on and, and, and what Jesus said to her, it was probably because of her sins. She knew she was a sinner. And she knew evidently a little bit about Jesus to have been in this situation. Now, it says in verse 39, Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Well, a little bit about the Pharisees. You know, the Pharisees were legends in their own mind. They, I mean, they thought they were up here, uh, that they basically did no wrong, that they were perfect in the law and knew all about the law. And, and especially the people who sinned, I mean, they looked down on them. And that was the situation, it seems, here. So he says to himself, if this man were a prophet. We get a little indication here as to why he invited Jesus to the meal in the first place, don't we? He wanted to observe Jesus and see, well, I wonder what prophetic utterance he'll, <laughs> he'll say or some bits of wisdom or maybe he'll even perform a miracle for us, you know. And, and he was maybe sizing Jesus up. Do, is he really what he says he is or who he says he is and so forth. Verse 40, And Jesus answered and said to him, Now how would you like to, to associate and be around somebody that a answers your thoughts? <laughs> you know, that, would, uh, that could be unnerving a little bit. But anyway, Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, Teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii, the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? So we have the story Jesus tells, and this is often the way he would teach, wasn't it, with parables and so forth. So he said, you know, there was two debtors, one owed 500, one owed 50. Uh, the, the master forgave them both. Who would love him more? Well, Simon in verse 43 answered and said, I suppose, can't you just hear the arrogance there? I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And Jesus said, that's right. You have answered correctly, Simon. That is exactly right. Verse 44, then he turned to the woman and said to Simon. So he turns and faces the woman, but he's still talking to Simon. And he says to uh, Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. All were customary to do, but Simon hadn't done that. But she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss. Another customary thing to do. But this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Simon's going to love little. Why? Because he doesn't think he's sinned. I mean, I'm up here. Whereas the woman understood that she had sinned. And so she will love Jesus more. And then he said to her in verse 48, Your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And then he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. What an interesting, interesting account here that Jesus had being invited to this Pharisee's house and this woman uh, doing what she did with tears, wiping his feet with her hair, and anointing him with oil. Well, what would you 
describe this situation. How did he treat Simon and how he treated the woman? When you think about that, in one sentence say, how did he treat those people? My sentence would be, is that he lowered, brought down Simon. I mean, he put him in his place. <laughs> you didn't do what you're supposed to do to a guest. But then he turns to the woman, doesn't he? And he lifts her up. Go in peace. You know, I mean, it's uh, your sins are forgiven. And uh, in one sentence, now you might come up with another sentence, but that's what I see happening here as he's treating these two opposite individuals, if you will, One's brought down, the other is lifted. Well, let's see if that continues a little bit and some other occurrences. Look, let's go to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. And this is the story of wee little Zacchaeus, you know. We've heard this since little bitty uh, when we were small. About Zacchaeus climbing up the sycamore tree to see Jesus. Beginning in verse 1, Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short statue. Yeah, he was short, but Zacchaeus wasn't dumb. I mean, he knew where the path led to, and he saw a sycamore tree there, right? And, and he climbs it to get to see Jesus. So he ran ahead, verse 4, climbs up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. Now, the sycamore trees around here, pretty slick bark. I mean, I couldn't probably climb any tree right now. But, you know, those are harder trees to climb. And yet, uh, my understanding is uh, the sycamore tree... Uh, in this part of the country, the, the, the bark is much rougher. It's much easier to climb. So don't try to, to uh, compare that to our sycamore tree here. Verse 5, And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste, come down, for today I must stay at your house. Now let's compare that with maybe a Pharisee. Let's show you one of, the, one of the Pharisees, maybe Simon, that would have been walking along the path and maybe there would have been people around and listening to what he had to say. And, you know, he would have maybe seen Zacchaeus up there. Oh, there's that tax collector. Well, I will know what I'll do. I'll just stop here under the tree and just give him a little what for. <laughs> we'll just give him a sermon especially for tax collectors, Right? Now, that's what the, probably the Pharisee would have done. But Jesus, of course, aware of all the situation, sees Zacchaeus, knows that he wants to see him. Come down. Let's go eat together. Uh, now it really invites himself, doesn't he, to his house. Verse 6, So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. Look at the reaction of verse 7 of the other people around, the Jews. And when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He's gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. The reaction is that he's a sinner. He's, he's, they put him down, and by doing that, they elevate themselves, right? We're better than that. Why is he associating with a sinner? Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Now the old law said twofold. He's willing to go four times. But notice it says, If I have. Some believe that Simon may not have really been a sinner. He just was a tax collector. <laughs> But I think as we look at the next two verses, it's very likely that maybe he had sinned because of what Jesus said in verse 9. Today, salvation has come to this house because he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. Again, we see in this account where Jesus, it seems, 
lifted up the despised, lifted up the sinner, and yet brought down possibly those around him by saying, no, it's good for me to go and eat with this person. He shows both uh, instances. Well, let's go to a, another passage, another uh, account in John chapter 8. Try to get through these and, and uh, not keep you too long. John chapter 8, and we will begin in verse 3. Here the says in verse 3, The scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And I'm sure you're familiar a little bit with this story, but let's go maybe look at it from a different point of view here. Uh, she was caught in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Well, the first thing you want to ask is, where is the man? If they grabbed the woman in the very act, why didn't they grab the man too? Well, he very well could have been a part of this uh, whole shenanigan to try and test or trap Jesus. This is a big trap for Jesus, as we see later on. So they said this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. And then they say in verse 5, Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. Well, it does say that. That was the penalty for being caught in the act of adultery. And so they say, what do you say? So what's the big trap here? Well, if Jesus said, yeah, let's stone her. Well, then he would have been going against Roman law, would you not? Can't kill. Uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't allow capital punishment here among the Jews. Uh, the Romans are the only one that could do that. That's why they had, for Jesus, you know, had to go to the Roman government. So the big problem was, if he said, well, don't stone her, well, he's going against the Mosaical law. If he says to stone her, you see, he's going against the Roman law. What will Jesus do? What is he, how is he going to get out of the trap? Looks pretty solid. Oh, they're, they're dealing with the master teacher here, aren't they? And so, notice what it says. Verse 6. This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear them. <laughs> I mean, you just you can just see this, can't you? Here they are all excited and, and throwing this woman in the midst of them may have, may have been naked. I mean, I don't know. They shamed her. And, and they're saying, okay, what do you say? What do you say? And, they're, and they, you can tell they keep on asking this question. And Jesus is pretending he doesn't even hear them. He's just writing in the ground. Well, what's the obvious question? <laughs> what is he writing on the ground? Everybody wants to know, right? <laughs> what is he writing on the ground? And, and, and yet that's not really the question. The question is, why? Why did he stoop down and write on the ground? I know all of us have probably gotten into arguments before, and we know how that arguments can sometimes, things can get heated. And the hair, you know, stands up in the back of your head, and you can just feel that hotness back there, and, and you're, you know... Well, we know people pull guns over stuff like that, don't they? And, they? and they try to hurt one another. I mean, arguments can become heated. So some people say that they think Jesus just stooped down and rode on the ground just and act like he's not hearing them just to diffuse the situation just a little bit. Let's, let's just calm down here a little bit. Well, and it also allowed them time to think about it, didn't it? They were all in an uproar, no doubt, and it kept asking him. Well, let's look. Verse 7, so when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them. So finally Jesus gets up and says something, and he says, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. 
classic example of where you quote one part of the law, but you don't quote or, or consider the whole law. Not only does it say that she is to be stoned, but the first one to cast the stone is to be without sin. Look at what happened. Verse 8, so after he said that, what did he do? Well, he just stooped back down and started writing on the ground again. Though, then those who heard it, verse 9, being convicted by their conscience, being uh, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last, and Jesus was left alone of the woman standing in the midst. So one of the oldest probably said, uh, um, you know, I, I've, I have stolen before. Another one says, well, I, I remember telling a lie one time, and so they just started leaving one at a time while Jesus is writing on the ground. What a master. Um, so they all left. Verse, uh, verse 10, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? <laughs> Has no one condemned you? Well, and again, the old law. Got to have two or three witnesses before you can condemn someone. Nobody left. Nobody left. She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Could Jesus have been a witness? No. He didn't. He wasn't there to see her, so he didn't even satisfy as being a witness to her committing adultery. Of course, he knew it, but not as a witness. Then Jesus spoke to them again and said, No, I'm sorry, that's, that's as far as I want to go. Uh, Neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. So, what, what did we learn from this? Does it follow the pattern that we're looking at here? Again, he lifts up the fallen. And he brings down those accusers, those that put themselves above everybody else. That's how he treated people. Somebody put themselves up here way too high, he brought them down. For those that are low and without hope and maybe sin, he would try to give them hope. Tell them that you can do better. Well, they wanted to kill her because she was a sinner. Jesus wanted to save her. Luke chapter 10 is the last one we'll look at tonight. Luke chapter 10. We turn over there. We have the account with Jesus and a lawyer. Now this lawyer uh, is supposed to know the law, isn't he? Uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? In other words, what do I have to do to be saved? Well, Jesus said to him in verse 26, What is it written? You know the law. What's in the law? What does it say? And so he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, <clears throat> and your neighbor as yourself. Again, Jesus said, you have you rightly answered. That's right. This, he says, you, you go and do and you will live. Verse 29, but he wanting to justify himself said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Well, it's already told us in verse 25, this was to test Jesus again. Try and catch him. And so he wasn't done with him after the first question. The second one, who is my neighbor? Well, of course, we know that Jesus then tells the, the account here or the parable of the uh, man who was uh, beaten and wounded and fell among uh, thieves, uh, what we call the, the Good Samaritan. 
And uh, he was uh, in bad shape, near death, it says. I'm not going to read it all, but, you know, along comes a, a priest and goes by the other side. Somebody you would expect to help him. Then comes a Levite, and he, d he doesn't help either. But then Jesus chose a Samaritan in the story. And the Samaritan is the one that really comes through, helps this individual. We know bandaging gives him first aid, we would say, and then takes him to the inn uh, to be cared for until he heals up. And so we find here that Jesus is telling the man this, and he says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor who fell uh, among the thieves? Well, the lawyer said, he who showed mercy on him. And then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Again, the Samaritans, Jesus picked out, I mean, the Jews hated them. They despised them. And so here the lawyer, having put himself up here, if you say, so to speak, and, and then knowing how he felt about Samaritans, plugs in his uh, story here, a Samaritan, and, and then ask him the question, who is the neighbor? Again, showing you, you shouldn't look down. There's good in everyone. And the person who does good, that's the ones that we, uh, that are good, that are doing good. So, a glaring principle, as I've already said before, in all of these accounts, as we try to learn how Jesus treated others, as I've said, is he brought down the proud and he lifted up the fallen. We see this in Scripture over and over, Ezekiel 21, 26. Thus says the Lord God, remove the turban, take off the crown, nothing shall remain the same Exalt the humble and humble the exalted. In James chapter 4 and verse 6, it says, Therefore, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. In Luke 1, 46 to 56, pretty long, lengthy reading there, of where Mary was so thankful to God for the child that she bore. And she goes on and she says, He has shown strength with His arm. He has scattered the proud and the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones. He exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things. And the rich He has sent away empty. Bringing down the haughty, lifting up the fallen, the desperate, those without hope. And then Jesus said in Matthew 23, 12, Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. This is what Jesus did. The question is, how do I do it? Who's going to listen to me? How can I... Go to someone with, say, lots of money or lots of power. I mean, how would we go to the President of the United States, maybe, and say, okay, you know, how do I, how do I bring down some of that? Or maybe, how do I lift up someone who is so hopeless and in sin, maybe a drug addict or, or an alcoholic or... Whatever, you, you, you can think of a lot of situations where people are so down and out without hope. The church, if you will, is a place where those people need to be able to come and we give them hope. How do we do that? There's only one way. One way only. We teach them the gospel. The gospel is the only thing that will lift those up, bring the haughty down. If we can teach them the gospel and they obey it, 
we know that we're none of us are any better, higher up than anybody else. We're all one in Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? That's how we do it. That's how important the gospel is. That's how powerful the gospel is. It is the power of God into salvation, as Paul said. What a lesson for us if we want to be like Jesus and bringing down the haughty, lifting up the fallen. The way we do it is by teaching, preaching, living. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I hope that everybody here is Christians, but if you're not, we want to give you that opportunity as we always do and because it's so important. If you're not in Christ, there is no hope for you. But if you'll obey the gospel, your sins can be washed away. You have a f- new start in life. And then you, you can learn to be like Jesus every day from then on. Do what he says. And then we'll have that home in heaven someday. If you are a Christian and you've left your first love, we'd invite you to come. And, and if we... Uh, can pray with you and for you. We'll be glad to do that. Won't you come as together we stand and sing.